Hello, everyone. Welcome. Happy, happy Monday. Thank you for tuning in today. Hello and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 920th New Social Environment. I'm Eleanor, a programs associate here at the Rail, and today I have the huge pleasure and privilege of being your MC for a conversation featuring Willa Nassiter and Ksenia M. Sobaliva. We are thrilled to welcome poet Nora Treat Baby here to close today's program. Before we get started, the Brooklyn Rail acknowledges Black Lives Matter, and here in New York, we are on Lenape Hoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsie, Muncie, and Lenny Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation. We recognize land acknowledgments are not a replacement for necessary decolonial work, but serve as a reminder of place of the legacies of dispossession and enslavement that sustain and enrich the stolen land we are speaking from. And now to introduce today's guest and host, Willa Nassiter's practice investigates varied approaches to imaging. In both her paintings and photographs, the artist transforms everyday objects to the point of the surreal, collecting and accumulating her subjects before distorting and abstracting their forms through various analog, drawing and painting processes. Through abstracted form, she plays with the dualities of meaning and proposes an unraveling of perceived boundaries as they relate to gender and power. She has had solo exhibitions at the Whitney Museum of American Art, the Albright Knox Art Gallery, and elsewhere. And our host today, New York-based writer and art historian, Dr. Ksenia M. Sobaliva specializes in queer art and culture. She holds a PhD from the Institute of Fine Arts at NYU, and her writings have appeared in the Brooklyn Rail, Bomb Magazine, and various other journals and exhibition catalogs. She has curated exhibitions at Candace Meany Gallery, La Mama, and Assembly Room. She is currently the Andrew W. Mellon Postdoctoral Fellow in Gender and LGBTQ Plus History at the New York Historical Society. I'm so thrilled to have you both on the NSC today um, to discuss this amazing show. And with that, I will hand it off to you, Ksenia. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eleanor. And thank you to everyone at The Rail for making this possible. It's always a pleasure to host these. Um, and thank you to Willa for joining me today. And congratulations on your beautiful show, uh, which is both dynamic and soothing. Um, it was real uh, joy to visit. We can start the slideshow now and just move through and maybe um, let's begin with the photographs because the show uh, features um, first a few photographs by Willa and then um, a new body of paintings. And as I understand it, Willa, um, for the photographs, you essentially create these sculptural compositions in, in your studio. Uh, which you then photograph and rephotograph and rephotograph, and even though, and it arrives at at an image that that is reminiscent of a collage, but actually it is not digitally manipulated. It is it is actually just um, you know the the photograph, um, and and you you arrive at this at this collage like image because you're using a lot of re reflective surfaces. Um, and including mirrors. And I wanted to start by asking you about, about that in particular, because you know, in art history, the mirror has such an interesting, um, interesting history uh, because of its, you know, the we could talk about the psychoanalytic quality and, and Lacan's mirror stage, but also just um in terms of the mirror offering space or offering the potential for a self-portrait, right? Uh, so I'm thinking, for example, of Van Eyck's Arnolfini portrait, where you you, you see you see the artist uh, in the lone mirror behind them, uh, or Claude Cahun's employment of mirrors. Um, so I would love to hear your thoughts around these reflective surfaces and whether in any way you see these as, as self-portraiture. Um, and could we go to slide 21, Elena? Yeah, it's a great place yes. to start. <laughs> um, thank you so much and thanks for having me, everybody. Uh, yeah, so these photos are actually not uh, re-photographed ever. That's like a process that I've used that maybe like I could talk a little bit about in terms of like what reflection 
means, but these these photographs are single images that uh, ha <clears throat> have not been rephotographed at all. But like the the mirrors are both like panels of mirrors that I've broken up or sheets of mylar that can be bent and distorted. But I think the the idea that you can take something that's like a solid object and through reflection distort it and like change its legibility and then have like a through someone else looking at the reflection who doesn't know what the um what the like initial solid object is it has like a whole new um meaning or sense of legibility that that then becomes more about the person who's looking at it than the thing that existed before that um so I used to make these constructions in my studio and photograph them. And then I would make a print of that photograph. And that image was something that looked like a vitrine maybe, or like a shop window or something like that. Uh, it was very fixed and then for a while, I was doing a lot of different stuff to the prints that I would make, uh, ranging from like, I, I, I would like trample all over them. I would burn them. I would get them soaking wet. I would like do these things trying to like break apart the, the image that I'd started with. And then I arrived at this process, which was to coat the print in mineral oil, which is like a really reflective oil that you can it's like if you stand in front of a pool of water and you look at yourself, you know, it's that kind of a reflection. And so I would photograph the reflections on the surface of the image to create like a third image kind of that's both like, um, you had brought up to me earlier the that MoMA show with like uh, <laughs> windows and oh, yeah. mirrors and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah, 1978. There was a there was a MoMA show about photography since 1960, and it was titled "Windows and Mirrors." Yeah, yeah, which was sort of funny because I I mean I actually didn't know about that show, but if if I was to apply it to this like process of in, image making, it's like the photo starts as a window into something else, and then the the reflections that occur on the surface of the image are like a mirror, and so it would be like. A picture that I'd taken inside my studio but I was uh like outside on the street and like the reflection of a street lamp would become an abstracted form that entered into the uh the picture and so like a way of bringing your environment into into some like interior space or like an outside environment into an interior space I think I've always really liked taking photos where I'm I'm always inside when I'm taking the photos of my sculpture, but I like to have the window in my studio come back into the frame of the photo um, as a kind of like anchor to like time and place now. But then these, the things that I'm actually ending up with are, are feel very um, like fantasy or fantasy or like pretend or uh, like very romantic and not really grounded in the real. Mm -hmm. Um, and where do you source the objects for the sculptures? Are the, do you ever specifically um, get something knowing that it will end up in a sculpture, or are you? Is it like a more uh, unconscious process of? Uh, of it's just it's um, it's like walking down the street and being like, oh, <laughs> like this is gonna go in the trunk of my car now. Uh, yeah, it's. It's a, it's a lot of stuff I just find uh, and it, I'll feel some like pull towards it. I mean, you, as, as everybody knows, you can find an enormous amount of interesting things walking around on trash day. Um, but I also like going to estate sales. I started doing that a couple of years ago because there's something very intense about going into somebody's house just as they left it and who you're never going to know. And not that like most people are picking over uh estate sales for like collectible items or things that you can resell but it's it's very interesting to me just to see the things that people hold on to in their lives or the things where you're like why is this here and like why did you hang on to these jars from 1978 or you know 
uh, getting a sense of a person's life through um, what they left behind. Uh, yeah, that that kind of process is, yeah, where I, where I feel like there's some significance to the objects that I'm seeing that I don't necessarily understand or know. Um, yeah. But, so, sorry, go ahead. No, oh, it's okay. What are you going to say? Uh, so how did you transition from photography? Most people know you as a photographer. Um, how did you transition from photography into painting more recently? Yeah. Um, and let's well, go to let's go through the paintings now. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. I think. I mean, I was. I've always like made paintings, kind of, and and lots of different kinds of art, maybe more in private. And when I started showing my work, it was very helpful for me to have these constraints around what it was that I made and how I made it. And like photography can give you these parameters and limitations that are really fun to try to push up against and, and break from. Like if you understand a photo to function in one way, or if I was like, okay, I'm making portraits, I want them to be bodily. I want them to have personality, but I don't want to include other human beings in them. Like, I want to make photographs, but I want them to be very tactile. I want to feel like my hand is present in the photographic image. Like I had, I guess, yeah, I had a lot of rules for myself. And then I kind of felt like I had gone as far, like I reached the limitations of, of what I could, not what I could do, but maybe what was like exciting to me about working in that way. And that was probably like uh I had been making photos in that way for seven years I think and um I guess I had some sort of burnout where I wanted to figure a way to introduce to to like pull myself back into the process of making things where I didn't know exactly what was going to happen um and so I think the paintings became a response to some of the frustrations that I had had with, with um, photography. And then they became a counterpoint to them where uh, through making paintings for a few years and not, and not taking photographs, I became like, I, I found myself one when I was making the paintings, thinking a lot more about, a, a photographic conversation or imaging or imaging technologies and not necessarily the history of painting, which when I was making the photographs, I was thinking a, a lot about inserting some kind of uh, conversation around painting into when you look at a, a photographic image. And so I, they, yeah, it started to balance. I, I started to like balance myself out maybe and, and get to some kind of um, equilibrium where making photos again became interesting to me. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's, I it, I felt very misunderstood in the process. Like I had left photography behind or something like that. Um, that, that, yeah, to make a group of paintings meant that I was no longer interested in photography. And I was like, no, these paintings are about, they're about yeah. images and they're about like the, this, this pulling apart the screen of an image or like the, the translucency and and yeah uh, yeah I want I want them to exist alongside one another I want them to like have a relationship and I think looking at the paintings make you, makes you look at the photographs in a different way and in some ways the photos are a key to when you look at a painting beginning to recognize imagery um, that can come out in it definitely I I think they're I think they're very much in dialogue with each other and there is in in both there is this like interplay between light and surface and reflection and perception um and it also it made me think when I was walking through um it made me think of lyrical abstraction and uh you know but but with like a, an additional surrealist quality to it um and I I wanted to ask you also how you arrive at the compositions um whether it is a more intuitive process than um than the photographs um or 
like are the are the painterly gestures spontaneous? Do you make a sketch first? Um, what's that process like? Yeah, I make um I make drawings before the paint. I make like uh pencil drawings. Um, and they the drawings are usually like one or two elements of the paintings stacked on top of one another and that becomes like the skeleton for the painting mm -hmm. sometimes I'll draw from photographs that I've taken like not not the not the objects in the photograph but like the reflections um of light and then that becomes the form that is superimposed uh in the painting but yeah I think when I'm making them I'm I'm definitely thinking about stacking images on top of one another and to the point that, or, or uh, yeah, to the point that they, they break apart and that like what is recognizable about the thing um, dissolves, which, which is what, you, how you would use like negatives on top of one another or like that kind of um, translucency. But in terms of material, I like, it's very thin, um, acrylic wash uh acrylic dispersions that I'll like lay down and then wipe away and so there's like traces of uh one form on top of the other and then revisiting them mm -hmm. painting a little while later where I can't recognize what where it had started and and um where that's, that's interesting because that makes me think that that again brings me back to surrealism and you know artists like Max Ernst were employing this method called decalcomania where they would press a surface like aluminum or um against like the, the painted surface and then that would leave um that would leave a mark and then they would paint on the on that basically and it, it was all about the sort of spontaneous image, the uncontrolled image that that arose um, versus the painted one. Um, I don't know if I'm explaining that well, but um, I was wondering what are what are what are some of your um, informants in in your art making practice? Because the photographs made me think of um, someone like Sarah Charlesworth, um, and uh, and then the paintings, um, you know surrealism yeah. I think well uh, there's something about when you're talking about the the surrealists and the processes that people use um to like I feel like some artists myself included are trying to leave themselves behind when they are making the things that they're making which other I mean there's there's one approach that's very like set your sights on something and actualize it and there's something else which I feel like I relate to more, which is like, I want to do enough to something that I no longer feel like it's mine. And I feel like the there was a lot in, in surrealism and these like games and ways of distancing yourself from, from the work that you make. And especially in painting, um, it's like because painting has this, this uh, there's this connotation of like artistry and mastery and like the, you know, there's this like individualism in it. And then and in photography, there's this idea of remove because you're using this the camera, but like, yeah, with my paintings, I want, I want to like forget what my intention was in, in making it. Um, and to, I guess, get as far away from, from something that is legible as, me telling another person what to see or think as possible. Um, mm -hmm. And so in terms of influences, I mean, Sarah Charlesworth is, is a hugely important artist to me, but like I probably the photographers that I looked at the most when I was at least like coming to understand myself as an artist were more people like Nan Golden or, I mean, Alvin Baltrop, we, we talked about a little bit, but like these very, photographs that were intensely personal and like so much about sharing your interiority. And then the thing that I saw in Sarah Charlesworth's work is that she had like emptied herself out entirely and everything was so controlled. And there were these like really precise vessels that like 
the viewer like filled themselves into in a way, or at least that's how I understood them, or that was what was compelling to me about it. And so maybe it's like somewhere in between because I use this imagery that's very personal to me and that's very like specific to my psyche or, you know, um, the things that I find attractive. Uh, but I also want to drain whatever um kind of like individual like my own opinions out from from the thing itself if that, if that makes sense it's interesting that um you know you you took a lot of inspiration from people like Baltrop um who photographed who photographed people mm -hmm. mainly right I mean and then of course like the peers and the runes uh which I think resonates in your photographs as well but but and you started out photographing people, but then moved away from it and are now more interested in creating um, a present, a presence that is not representational, right? You're sort of steering away from, from representing the body because when a body is represented, we sort of rush to classify it, right? That's the, that's the great um, potential of queer abstraction. Um, so I would I would love to hear you speak about that a little bit more also. Yeah. Um, I think what I get excited by is, you know, the, the, I am representing things in my paintings. They all come from images of objects or, um, yeah, body parts or like they, they come from a real thing. And then it's really exciting to me when people look at them and they don't, and they recognize something else inside of them, maybe like that kind of misidentification is, is what is most interesting to me, maybe like um, earlier you, when we talked before you were like that, I want to talk about that painting of the duck. It's a duck, right? And I was like, yeah, it's a duck. It's not a duck, but like <laughs> the the thing that it's happens. Not a duck. No, it's not a duck. But like I always do that. I say yes when people think that they see something in my paintings because I feel like that's as important to the work work or like the the fact of that that you can make something and someone else can see something totally different inside of it, or that someone two people can be talking about the same painting and use completely different language to describe it. Like that kind of thing is very is interesting to me personally. I mean, yeah, when when applied to other ideas uh, in life, <laughs> that sort of misidentification is um, maybe more yeah. satisfying to me than picking a demographic to represent and representing it well. Yeah, this this is actually my favorite painting in the show with the duck. Uh, <laughs> Now that we're on this one, could you talk a little bit about just the process of, of arriving at this particular composition? Uh, yes. Now I'm curious to know. Yeah. What it? Well, it's what bird is. So it's a well, it's a deer. Uh, it's like the carcass of a deer is what the drawing started out from. Um, but I don't know how important that is necessarily. Uh, but I guess yeah, there are things that that give me a jumping off point in, in drawing. Um, and mm -hmm. this painting and then the other photograph that you also- um, Oh yeah, the torso, the photograph of the torso is, yeah. is another thing. Yeah. It's interesting that you selected them both because all of the photos in the show have kind of like a key to a painting. Um, so the, like in this case, there's a locking mechanism on the chest and there's also the, the painting that you, we're talking about has a sidewalk cellar in it. I had started making these drawings of the things that you walk by on the street and you fall into if you're like me. Um, but the, the yeah, there's, me there's meant to be a kind of tether between the work. So when I make a group of photographs and then I respond to that by making a group of paintings that are supposed to have a little kind of a key to the work that came before it. And, and so, I was surprised, but like kind of tickled by the fact that the two that you selected as your favorites are are meant to be twins together. Um, but yeah, I mean the this photograph, I started making a lot of. Um, 
I mean, I, I use like inanimate objects on body parts a lot. I was thinking about how, in, in terms of like a personal memory, um, I went my, an ex, an ex of mine, um, he, when we were dating, uh, before he got top surgery, I would like stack objects on his nipples all the time. And I would put like shells and gummy bears and, you know, um, eggs and egg cartons. And I was like obsessed with like putting things on top of his body in this way that was very like playful and like stupid. But also I think the the instinct to try to, I don't know, we all don't want to be trapped in our bodies and a way of like bringing some kind of levity or a sense that you can make something into whatever you want it to be and that our bodies can be used in ways that make us forget the ways that we don't want to have them um, is, is something that's like important to me and probably connected to why I make figurative work that's not necessarily um, about one person's body, but uh, so the chest, yeah, I was, I was also making a lot of paintings after my sibling got top surgery where the, the rib cage would be made out of, um, I don't know, different, uh, sticks and the, the nipples were like casters on wheels and they like bodies, all they are just like a combination of junk, <laughs> basically. Um, and. <laughs> And how to make that beautiful or how to allow yourself to feel interested or engaged with the body if you don't want to be stuck on the stuff that doesn't feel good about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there is a there is a inherent queerness to your work that is not, um, you know, that is not necessarily easily legible, but but very much present. Yeah, um, I mean, I think it's legible to people who have who, for whom it's legible to <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, in terms of just, you know, like today, there is so much, so much of what, what is, um, let's say advertised as queer art, you know, is, is, is figurative, figurative painting, right? And like representing a community. And so it's interesting to think of, of other ways of representing a community that are not, you know, traditionally, traditionally representative, you know, in the, <clears throat> in the traditional outdated sense sense of the of the term yeah um, yeah. yeah and that sorry go ahead no I was just gonna say that I think the kind of like camp of queerness that I situate myself in is how to like leave your body behind entirely or like that are that we can exist outside of our bodies and that's not like a that's not declarative in the I mean that's just me personally um but yeah I well, to... sorry just yeah go ahead Okay. I was going to say, which also makes me think of someone like Robert Rauschenberg and his combines, right? And uh, represent representing the body through a bed, right? Or um, and 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 also relates to this um, to this fragmented nature of being that that you're working with as well, right? And and uh, queer identity as um, as you know, not taking this like fixed wholeness as as a given and instead this is why I always say that collage is the most queer medium because it's all about the shattering of identity and then putting it back together in a way that makes most sense to you no. yeah yeah absolutely um I mean I I don't know how much I have to say specifically outside of that I agree with you <laughs> or that like I think that um figuring out how to make what you want out of what's around you is a very queer sensibility and and how to like give meaning to things that maybe are discounted in other like through and like in the world in other ways and how to like take possession back to, or like make make erotic and make sensuous uh parts of of our existence that maybe don't get that kind of stage normally um that's exciting to me and that's also yeah. something that I feel like photography plays such a that has such a huge hand in like the way I mean obviously the way that things are represented but like the cast that you can like the the attention that you can give to something the way that photographic effect can make something that's really um 
shoddily made have this meaning and presence and uh, power. Yeah, I guess just the, yeah, I know that I can take a photo of something and make it have more power than it may to like the eye and the everyday. And similarly, I feel like with painting, I know, I, I believe that there's a way to just totally annihilate or break apart the, um, what we think of as an object's presence and maybe like dissolve the, the edges of what something, what something means when we see it in the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's, it's interesting that you say edges because I feel that one of the things in, in your painterly compositions is that um, the edges are very much there. You know, th there, is, um, there is a certain outline to the forms mm -hmm. that are possibly shape-shifting. Um, I wanted to ask also whether you think of these as, or whether there is a way in which you think of these as still lives, um, because one of the wonderful things is that the when looking at the paintings, that they do seem to constantly, um, the shapes seem to be floating or shifting, and so you're you're like negating the still aspect of the still life, right? There, the forms are not fixed on the surface, um, which again goes back to the reflective quality of the photographs. Um, so, what is your what are your thoughts around still life? Yeah, I mean, I think well, the thing that's interesting to me about still life is like the double meaning of of what is depicted in still life. So, like art historically that that you know these objects are keys to to um in like renaissance paintings or or that that you know a fruit doesn't meet, isn't just a fruit it's it's something else entirely or like the significance of objects maybe but yeah i think what happens when you or the way that i either render these things or like catch the reflection of them is meant to make them not recognizable as as the thing that they are. And so that's very different because as you're saying, still lives are just totally fixed. And then maybe my position is more that nothing is fixed and that like mm -hmm. uh, what you think something is, it's actually something else. Mm -hmm. But how much metaphor, how much metaphor is in your work? Um, I feel like it's more metonym than metaphor, right? Like it's not that this thing means this other thing. It's just like, no, like your, your chat, it is that <laughs> like, this is also this. Um, mm -hmm. And so, and maybe that's yeah. why things get placed on top of one another and um, are meant to be harmonized in such a way that they totally, there, there is like balance between two distinct objects or ideas. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then I'm also I'm curious about the 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 role that color plays in um in these paintings as well. Yeah. Um I don't know. It's funny. I yeah, I mean I it's pretty uh it's pretty intuitive. Um hmm. I thought it was the perfect fall show because there's a very autumn it's a very autumn palette of, yeah, of palette. reds. Yeah, yeah. I feel like in like 20 years, I'm going to look back at my work and I'm going to understand alongside my life what made me start using this completely different color palette. I'm not quite there yet, but I, I, I think it'll maybe make sense uh, a little further down the line because I know that, especially with my photographs, I took, I took these, uh, I took photographs that were very much like um, coming out of the darkness and then mm -hmm. something changed for me and I really wanted everything to feel almost like sun drenched or like yeah light light was um burning out parts of them and maybe that has to do with my personal life but I don't know <laughs> um yeah I are, think are, are people hugging in this one say again are there people hugging in this painting uh yeah you could say that yeah yeah 
yeah um uh the painting started as a teapot um or like a I, like broken pottery and then um it gets yeah there but there are I I feel like painting allowed me to put people more um like lit just like literally paint a human body um in a way that I wouldn't really let myself unless I had built it uh within my photographs so there's a much more looseness in terms of um yeah I'll I'll notice people in a photograph who are whose bodies are like positioned in a certain way that I want to like pull out and use in something else uh, and I feel more agency I guess in painting and doing that mm -hmm. and then how do you arrive at, at the scale for the paintings um because it's it they're pretty varied but I noticed that the photographs are much smaller than the paintings uh, yeah. which I know you've made very large photographs as well but then in this particular exhibition the photographs are quite quite small and then the paintings are much larger um that is true uh I think the uh, this the scale is dependent on like the work itself like I wanted the the uh, the original drawings that I made for the paintings, I wanted to be able to see how much, um, I guess, like what kind of textual qualities I could achieve uh, with bigger gestures. Um, so that's where mm -hmm. the bigger ones came out of. Um, and I think that the, the idea that, um, what is that? There's something like good music, you have to be able to play it really quietly and it still sounds good or something like that. I think that's can sometimes be true of scale and work or, or the kind of work that I make at least. Like I wanna be able to make something that's that's small, that has the, um, and also that is very um, big and, <laughs> and uh, can like hold its own or something like that or, or it has integrity in its form but yeah I don't I don't feel like the scale is like um, this really like that I have rules around scale necessarily mm -hmm. and do you envision as as you're continuing your practice do you envision that you will maintain this this dialogue I know I mean of course we can't predict things but um that you will maintain this dialogue between the photographs or and and the paintings or do you think are you playing around with with moving into a body of work that is that is entirely painterly um i think that like even if i was to make photographs for like i mean if i was to make paintings for the next 20 years they would probably be to some degree about my photographs and i don't think that those things are ever mutually exclusive um yeah when, when I, it's the case with, with sorry go, go ahead just like whenever I I spend too long in one mode of working I find myself really craving the opposite it's opposite um so yeah I I mean I imagine myself to to continue making both in perpetuity but I also think that artists need longer timelines around how they're able to work through their ideas. And there's a lot of um, pressure from like the art industry, I think, to have really clear delineations between what, you know, what it is you're doing. Um, and I, yeah, I'm a, a believer in unstructured time for, for, for making things for your time yeah yeah exactly um yeah. yeah yeah I mean I'm thinking it's funny I I saw as I was seeing the people come into the zoom room that Marlene McCarty was in here who was a professor of mine at Cooper and I think about her work with Grand Fury and how she went from making that kind of like propaganda work into these large-scale like extraordinarily labored over and beautiful, like hyper-realistic drawings of of teenage girls, which is like, if I mean, they're, they're so far separate from one another that they are absolutely intertwined or like the two poles of, so I think, yeah, making art like that is very, um, 
that's how that's how I understand things to work. Yeah. So you can do the other, so you can do the other, so you can do the other. So can yeah. Do the other. yeah, I know that work well. And uh, hi, Marlene. Uh, and and it's it's all rooted still in in violence and language. Um, and I was thinking also, um, as you were talking, I was thinking of someone like Kathy Opie as well, who, you know, has never made paintings, to my knowledge, uh, but whose practice is entirely informed by by painting. You know, you could say that uh, her work is much more informed by by a Holbein painting than it is perhaps by the history of photography, um, which um, is interesting too. Painting sells better than photography, I think. Well you know, <laughs> I, I, it's, I think people have the wrong idea about that, <laughs> this is the truth, but I do think that, I mean, or I don't know, I can talk about, I mean, I can talk about it from my own experience, but the thing I was going to say about Kathy Opie is, like, I, especially with, when you're making things, and they're being considered in one canon, I feel like as an artist, I've always been, like, no, I really, really want this work to be considered in this other, within this, like, other art historical context, and sometimes that can be a guide towards what you go towards next, maybe like that if you want, I mean, making, making photographs for so long that I was like, think about these like paintings. I was like, okay, now I'm going to make paintings. And when I was making paintings, I was like, how can I get people to think about like imaging technologies or, or, or just like the image itself in, in a, in an abstract painting. Um, and yeah, if you're, if, the thing that you're mentioning about the market is something that I think gets in the way of people following their uh, instincts, maybe, or sticking to doing something through the period that people are really confused as to why you're doing it. Um, I know that I, I, I had a, I mean, I, I'm 33. I'm not very, I mean, I don't know, whatever that means, but like, uh, we're the same. Yeah. Yeah. I really felt a, like um, the feeling of waiting for the outside world to begin to like engage with you about the conversation that you're having in your own head. I think as artists, you're always like years ahead of like how someone else is like seeing or thinking about your work and being able to stick to doing it in one way when you're not really getting the feedback or the or being contextualized in the way that you might hope like the, I, I understand why it makes people stop doing things that they haven't done before yeah absolutely um since you mentioned Marlene I I, I have a I have a selfish question um that that I'm just very very eager to to know in your um you know in your education being in New York I believe if you went to school so you went to Cooper Union, right? Um, so studying art in New York as a younger queer person, uh, what was it like to study with, um, you know, a generation um, of queer people such as Marlene, who were, you know, just absolutely critical in the AIDS crisis and AIDS activism and this like intergenerational um Intergenerational. Um, I mean, when I look, but it's funny. I, I mean, it was it was enormously exciting and probably made for at least me as a pretty annoying student. Like, there's something about when when people's work is resonant to like a young person and like the ideas that they hold closest to their chest that they project onto the uh, <laughs> the teachers and professors probably mm -hmm. um, in a way that maybe now. Uh, I don't know. I mean, it's ex it's exciting. New York is such a rich. It's like the richest place to understand. I don't know in in the U.S. like how to be politicized as an artist and to, and to think about um, making your work and how it can function um, in the world around you. Uh, but yeah, I think I was like exposed to an enormous amount that I see other people who receive art educations in other parts of the country don't have access to necessarily. Um, and there was, yeah, I think that there was an emphasis on participating in um, some kind of art world while being a student that was 
really helpful to me. Like you're encouraged, I mean, you're very encouraged to not study art, but like see it all the time and talk about it. Um, but also yeah. people, the, the professors that I did have had no, there was no pressure to make things in the tradition of the medium that you were working in or, or even to make things that looked, you know, when you're in a sculpture class, you can bring in photographs when you're um, in a Marlene's drawing class. I remember showing a lot of videos and I didn't, it didn't occur to me that I even had to stick to something or that I, uh, yeah, it, it, I think after the fact, when I understood how work gets contextualized in a market or something, I understand medium specificity and the, um, the way that artists can, um, yeah, be slotted in as like a, whatever, you are a painter, you are a sculptor, you are X, Y, and Z thing. Yeah. Um, yes, like a DAO. Um, though I think, no not so much anymore but um I also wanted to ask you um and maybe that will be my last question but I wanted to ask you about the digital uh and perhaps we can go to the photographs again because I um I know that you're very consciously steering away you're not anti-digital but you're steering away from making digital interventions um to your photographs um at least in this case. I don't know if that's something that you have done in the past or not, but um, I would just love to hear your thoughts about the digital. Whenever I have to talk to my students about the digital, I feel kind of lost um, because I don't, I don't feel that I entirely understand it. Um, so I guess the question is what, in your opinion, what are, what are the pearls and perils of, of the digital? Yeah, I mean, I think the reason I'm I'm not like a technician. I don't I don't feel that kind of draw towards um, photography in that way. And so digital is never it's, it hasn't called to me as like a tool. But I'm absolutely interested in the way that digital imaging functions. Maybe in our world, anything from I've talked before about like um, watermarks or um, which are, you know, the stamp that goes on uh, digital images like Getty images or something, which are like a pr proprietary tool to be like, this image comes from this place and it always has to come back to there. And, and you have to know forever who made it and who owns it. And like, that's totally fascinating to me. And I think about how to make something that functions in, in opposition to that. So like, how to superimpose over an image in such a way that it makes it um, authorless or you can't tell where it comes from. Um, I've talked a lot about like spirit photography as an influence, which I've been thinking about in recent spirit photography to, to paraphrase is like uh, the spiritualists in the early um, 1900s, uh, they, they, created these elab there are photographers who would find people who were suffering or haunted or mentally ill and they would drug the people and stage these portraits with like gauze coming out of their mouth or light leaks or things to demonstrate the spirit that is haunting them and that they have been exercised in some way through the process and like uh it was a it was a ritual that people consented to but they also knew that when presented with the photograph on the other side, they felt like cured in some way, or like there was a visual articulation of some unrest inside of them. And like the way that photography can function in that way, where you know it's a setup, but also it still makes you feel something inside of you. Like you can think about face app or something, uh, these AI generation technologies where you can feed your face and turn yourself old or young or of a different gender. And I think about how loaded face app is in with within my friends or queer and trans people who sometimes people are like, I cannot look at this thing. Like, don't show me how I see myself because that's going to scare me or freak me out. Um, or how I like could be, you know, the, the idea of, a visualization of something inside of you that isn't necessarily 
legible to anyone else. And then having pictorial proof of it is very powerful in, uh, in both ways. So like the stuff like that, I'm thinking about all the time. I just, I don't really care about like, mm -hmm. like the digital in terms of taking mm -hmm. picture. Yeah. Yeah. That's fascinating. You'll have to send me some of those spirit. Oh yeah. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I don't know if I'm you do you've ever looked at What's that? I'm thinking of Dwayne Michaels. You oh, know how oh. he did all the yeah, the photographs where there's like ghosts and mm -hmm. um yeah. Yeah. Yes, but that's... I mean, yeah, I don't know. I feel like anyone who, who's ever had, I don't know, done the face app thing where they I mean I love to I see myself as a man all the time on face app. I'm like, now I have a beard, now I have this, now I have this, like and and then some people are like, I can't look at that, don't show me. And or like what yeah, what does it look like to feel young or um yeah, some kind of like manifestation of yourself. Well, just also most of all things like that just exposed how expose how everything is structured around a binary, whether it's gender or age, you know, male, female, young, old, happy, depressed, you know, and that's how how we tend to think about things, mm -hmm. um, which which queerness moves away from supposedly. <laughs> um, well, uh, thank you so much. I, I hope that this is the first of many conversations um, to come. I, I, I saw that we have been getting um, questions in the chat, so I want to make sure uh, to leave room for that. But thank you again so much. Thank you so much. I, I'm really enjoying this. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much, Cassania and Willa. That's been, it's been such an illuminating and exciting conversation it's really been such a joy to hear um thank you and yeah we have been getting some questions in the chat um and I selfishly would like to ask the first question to you Willa um I'm wondering if you could share more about how you like like in many of the paintings there's kind of the way I, at least in my um, perception kind of a central outline of a figure that definitely when I was looking at the show took time to kind of surface for me and um, notice but there's kind of and it's connected to the title often and I was wondering if you could share a little bit more about how you came or landed on that uh, outline or figure and it could either be broadly or if you want to speak about a specific painting I would be interested to hear about that. Your question is, um, the the figure the figurative elements in each painting, or do you see like a unifying figurative? I guess I see like us in all of the paintings, like kind of a central or large um outline of a figure or object. In all of them, that like is kind of obscured but then it kind of reveals itself and almost kind of feels like it's moving forward um and then I noticed that it often kind of tied into the title and the title would help me like recognize what the object is like for example in um spout there's like the kind of it looks like a teapot outline kind of in the center and it took me some time to like see that but then when I read the title more and connected them who was able to come forward a little more for me, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, this might just be totally like my perspective, but I noticed that as like a rhythm throughout the paintings. And if there is something that led you to, if you wanted to even just speak to that painting of Spout. Um, about yeah. the I think there's something maybe like when I feel, if I, if I start with something figurative in the painting, I uh I'm let I'm I'm working over uh like different colors or or shapes on top of it um I guess optically when it gets to the point where the first thing that you notice is not the figure or like the person is is when I feel like it's most successful or something because I mean our eye recognizes the human form much quicker than it does uh, anything else or there are parts of the body that are more immediately like clockable um 
And so I guess I think about it as uh, a test to know when a painting is done, when I feel like that's been like um, buried in some way. Mm. But it's, it's hard to know when you're the only person that's looked at something for a really long time, what it is that anyone else sees. So your, your feedback is, is interesting in that way. Cool. Thank you so much. That was, that was interesting to hear. Um, I wish I could hear so much more, but I'll, I'll share the mic. Um, our next question is from GE. Thank you, Eleanor. Thank you all. Um, I, I'm going to I'm going to add a little bit to my question away. Um, do you how do you come or hit upon this honoring of the handmade? And then the addition I was thinking of, especially if you were talking about the spirit photography, is are you getting? Do you believe? Um, you know, for lack of a better word, certain kinds of certain kind of emanations from some of the objects. Is that what's moving it? Mm -hmm. Like, do I think objects have personalities? Not necessarily, but maybe a vibe or a leftover decay of something that you I, know. I definitely think objects have vibes, or like we can give vibes to objects. <laughs> um, and yeah, uh, trying to put your finger on that thing that that gives something um, personality or a sense of you know. Um, yeah, I guess I mean, maybe personality is the right word for it. Uh, and trying to reproduce that or apply it to something else or like harness some kind of control over that. And and we can talk about photographic effect as doing that, right, in the ways that like film and television and, and how we how we can like manipulate through a, a still photograph. But um, it can also just ha happen in the way something is staged, you know, like Ikebana, or you put something in one way and then you're like, now it's angry and now it's, um, like coy and all, all that kind of a thing, yeah. Um, I think that in the same way that you can take the human body and you can remove like its uh, aliveness or you can make it sexless in some way, you can also put, you can put that onto the inanimate or, or I, I like to try to do that. I think also that's where your work really does connect with someone like Alvin Baltrop uh, and other queer photographers and artists that that engaged with you know the changing urban fabrics of New York City. I feel that your work also very much engages with that, with with the fabrics of New York City as a city. Yeah. Yeah, it's the only place I've lived in my adult life, so I feel very much like it's uh, present in my in my work and um yeah and it's endlessly inspiring it, it just is I mean, it is I'm, I'm sure everyone here feels that way wonderful thank you for that question ge um our next question today will be from inez inez i will give you the chance to unmute thank you very great conversation um, my question is, can you deconstruct identity? So my experience of identity is, or body, related to the body, is that the body is the subject and the object. So as the object, we are perceived by others or we perceive ourselves through concepts that have been given to us in our learning experience. So that's the objective, and there's so many concepts in the whole world that sometimes you could feel really crazy. Then there's the subjective, which is the wonderful things the body can do. The body can make a tomato garden, you know, the body can make a painting, the body can just, you know, just do so many things. So what would be your ideas about identity um, relating to subject and object? I think the 
maybe there, there's something in what you're saying about like the things that the world puts onto us around identity that there are some things that feel really immovable and and which is which is its own thing to wrap its head your head around but i think there's something liberating in in trying to circumvent or or avoid or or slip into something else or be perceived or like fit, construct environments for yourself where you can be perceived in a way that is uh, opposite to how you are received in the world or like um i think that I I like to think of what I can do or put out into the world as trying to allow for um, like a fuller or more fluid um, or like more fluidity in, in, in other, the way that other people feel seen also, right? Like it's like what I can control is putting out there um, a fr frame of, uh, mind that allows people to be more than one thing or like that's yeah uh, I don't know if that is that answering your I'm not I'm not totally sure I'm answering you mm. what I mean that's an impossible question <laughs> oh anyway. so well actually I think the question is um how uh, can you do that with art what no <laughs> Um, I think that, uh, I mean, art is like a, is absolutely like an arena for like putting yourself out into the world or like suggesting a world that you want to exist. Like, I think speaking to the audience that you want to see your work is also like a huge part of it, right? It's like you talk to the people who you feel like you can be heard by and maybe not not get so bogged down by anybody else really um and then similarly you're like i am like listening and observing and like taking an inventory of the world and describing that through my lens and uh, and it, it's there's a, a dialogue that can happen with people who you want to be in dialogue with yeah i think that's an amazing answer i will just say yeah, I, I would say that, you know, rather than thinking about deconstructing identity, I, I would say that identity is constructed, you know, it's not a given, it's, uh, it's very slippery and fluid and not fixed, which I think will as paintings speak to without representing the body, right? Because identity, especially sexual identity, you know, and not that queerness is only sexual identity, of course, queerness has moved beyond sexual identity. Um, some decades ago but you know uh, particularly with sexual identity it, it it doesn't actually manifest itself on the body you know you can't see that I'm a lesbian just based on what my body looks like perhaps my mullet you know it, it, it goes beyond <laughs> it goes beyond the body so what are the and this is why I love I love abstraction I like I like figuration too I like it all but you know this is my particular investment in abstraction and, and and works like Willis is that it has this potential to speak about that that queer experience of, of being rather than what you look like as a queer person. So I would say that that's what art can do. Yes, thank you so much, Ksenia. Um, our next question will be from Marlene. Hey, um, so Willa, first, before I ask my question, it was really great to see your work and hear you talk about it. Secondly, the observation you made about the time of development for artists, the time of making versus the market and how that impinges on an artist's ability to experiment or to move into ground they're uncertain about. I thought was so sensitive and so on the mark. I just wanted to say, yay. <laughs> um, now I'll ask my question. Um, I have the simplest, most predictable question, which is, do we ever get to see the drawings? You can see the drawings. <laughs> <laughs> I think the drawings, yeah, absolutely. Um, do you exhibit them? 
Uh, I haven't ever exhibited them, but I would like to. Uh, I feel like what they, they exist and they're like they are their own their own thing actually. And I'd like I'd like to to make a show that that is only my drawings uh, and not not considered as like a preparatory tool for a painting, but actually just. Um, their own thing. Yeah, I, w I would actually like to do that. I haven't yet, but um, I feel like they stand alone as as yeah. works, but in some ways, when you show someone a drawing next to a painting, they think to map the drawing onto the painting, and there are ways that they can do that, so I feel like the drawings need to be shown in a totally different context in order to, like, function the way that I want them to. Excellent. Um, I would really like to see them sometime. I will. I will absolutely show them to you. Um, thank you. Yeah, keep us posted on that. I I also would love to see them. <laughs> I'm sure many people would. And our final question today will be from Chloe. Thank you so much, Ksenia and Willa, for this incredible dialogue today. Um, it was such a pleasure to listen to you. Um, my question is, Willa, does nostalgia factor into your photographs and your paintings? Um, when I was looking at them, I felt like I couldn't quite gauge if they were nostalgic for a past, a present, or a future. Um, and I'm curious, you know, how you factor nostalgia into that idea of bringing sentience to these objects that you're working with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think that, um, maybe the nostalgia that you're picking up on is that so much of the work that I loved and studied, I studied decades after it was made and it was made to be extraordinarily contemporary. And so I, I try to figure a way not to reproduce an, like a, some kind of effect that is hearkening to a time that doesn't exist anymore or to not make something that feels uh, retro, but I think certain tones or certain, um, like vis visual sensibilities are like um I am like drawn to them in that in a way that has to do with studying work that comes from the past maybe but my hope is that I can make them in a way that takes it out of um some type of tribute or uh or a reproduction or like some period piece art like I don't I don't want to make work like that I want to make sure it's 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 both either rooted in the now or is speaking to a dimension of that work that I, that is that is eternal or something that exists in the present or will continue to exist in the future I love that thank you so much thank you thank you all so much this is amazing I had a really nice time I appreciate such thoughtful questions and it's great to see all of your faces <laughs> yeah, thank you for that great question, Chloe, and thanks to everyone in the audience for your questions and for tuning in um, to this incredible dialogue. Uh, we do have a tradition of concluding with a poetry reading, and today I'm really, really thrilled to welcome our Poet Laureate of the Day, Nora Treat Baby, to the stage. New York City-based Nora Treat Baby's chapbook, Hope is Weird, is available from Other Weapons Distro. Her first full-length collection of poetry, Our Air, is forthcoming from Nightbo Books. Uh, welcome, Nora. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. It's, um, yeah, really beautiful. Willow's a really good friend of mine, and I'm a huge fan of her and her work, so it's um, beautiful to share some words. Um, I feel like just considering the conversation, like, as a... I something I used to write a lot about was the queer potential or not of destabilizing my own, but also identities outside of myself. Um, so I'm going to read some older poems that I think are like a little bit bent towards Willa's work and also the conversation that happened. Um, okay. Hell, O oh Earth, we are inside of you backwards. The stent, the lump, hello, hello, preceding grief. I, demon of loving yourself, deposited inward, ladylike, fall off a life in category. The pluralness of ground is a free wave summoning paths, 
species, wild type, upwards ramp, we are gone. Air touching or not touching, there is no partial hierarchy, none whatsoever of beauty. Predecessor heaven, soil broken, sending a few lines near orbit. Litmus earth, a normal circle, times colony, every planet is surging out empty. Hello earth, I hate my boss. He is nice enough, but he doesn't know we are trading each other piece by piece so that the conditions in which love is possible live elsewhere. Your ground flees underneath this absence. Truthfully, I go with the grain on management, listening closely to its melodies, its genders. I am listening to management because it wants to bring me out of continuous liquidation. Here I am stuck in the greatest body on the planet and it's still not enough. I want a relaxing attitude towards reality, a place to entwine the capillaries with the humongous air of free groove. In the end, what I get to share is disobedience. Me and my friends, we fuck up anything that needs us to explain ourselves. We plan to get back to you, Earth, by evaporating inside the question of our value. There is an echo inside of category, the essential value and pristine edgelessness of each and pure relationship. One is deposited by memory into the body of all things, yet I remain in skin for the sun. This is the aporia of a flexure that seizes modernity's movement. I am surplus creature. I can walk around the world and compare myself to the art. I can produce, quote, feel-good material. I can know myself through the dream synonym of statistical measurement. I can dissolve inside the room. I am allowed this. I can finger the breeze contingent that I'd stay at work in the development of ever new skin. But it is the most known quantity that each fever or river that enacts its murmuration as a gesture towards infinity creates a new center. Radiating away from outward, dragging with newness, the field is open by centripetal arrangement. Nothing is freed, betweenness and everything. Category does not need to toil to world, bin, world build the earth it commands. It is our own practice to look the objects of the universe in the eyes and lower them to the level of a name, every plant with its pronoun. Hello, earth. I have driven to the edge of who I can be. I am also a sphere and I am a woman. It's what they tell you when you tell them you are not. They tell me the architecture is for my own good, that these clean lines and high ceilings will create finer and more graceful movements in the soul, but I cannot be in here with all this normal air. The new government is signaling that the self is the lawman now. It's the norms that concern me, different slants pointed at the same object. I step out to consider why my transness doesn't feel like a bird at all. The norms change around me as I change. Is this proof there is no sound of sound? I am the type of woman that feels a strong connection to her body, the penalties and the perfection. In the end, to know oneself isn't any kind of freedom. If I unspooled you, Earth, I would see that it is lava's behavior that burns your surface to its form. Territory denies paddle towards not a world. Floating but prostrate, one single collapse, the prairie of velvetness, of extinction, my own grief shared is the new voter. Oncoming time, a temperature of mercy and machine through on top of now. Swept environment, weeds, Weeds grow in night for sun's want of material conflict to a worsening surface. Terraqueous apocalypse nonetheless, one idea pinned to a wall, a secret tree gets free. Thank you. Nora, thank you so much. That was so stunning. It felt like an amazing extension of the conversation. I'm super grateful. Thank you. Um, and thank you so much again to Ksenia and Willa for the beautiful, beautiful dialogue. And definitely go catch the show up for, I think, one more week about 
um, until the 21st. So don't miss it at chapter. Um, thank you also to Nicole from chapter for helping us prepare for today. And we'd also like to thank the Terra Foundation for American Art for sponsoring our NSC program and making these conversations possible and for their support of our archive, which you can view on the Rails YouTube channel and where this conversation will be up shortly. For the past 23 years, the Brooklyn Rail has provided a platform for arts, culture, and politics in our free monthly publication and public events like our daily NSC. Check the chat for a link to donate to support the work we do here at the Rail. And join us tomorrow at 1 p.m. for a conversation with the Rails October Critics page contributors, Rex Butler, Todd Cronin, Penny Florence, Joe Fife, WJT Mitchell, Joseph North, and Saul Ostro, hosted by guest critic uh, Jeremy Gilbert Rolf. We will conclude tomorrow with a reading by none other than our friend G.E. G.E. Schwartz. Cannot wait. Um, please do tune in tomorrow and thank you all so much again for being here. You can turn on your microphone and say hello and goodbye as you leave. Thanks everyone. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, uh, thank, thank you so much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.